scaling, the interconnect hasn't nearly kept up with the growth in the compute. From EE Tech and All About Circuits, this is Moore's Lobby. I'm your host, Daniel Bogdanoff. Today in the lobby, we're shining a light on silicon photonics and why interconnects are a big challenge for the world of data centers, AI, and supercomputing. I'm joined by Steve Klinger, VP of Product at Light Matter, where they are taking a novel approach to programmable photonic interconnects and even designed the world's first general purpose photonic AI accelerator. Steve, thanks for being here today. Oh, thank you very much, Daniel. I appreciate it. Really appreciate the opportunity. I'm curious, how did you first get into the wide world of tech? Well, I, I was born and raised in Silicon Valley. I was the son of an aerospace engineer that worked at Lockheed building satellites for many, many years. So I suppose I came into it somewhat naturally, having seen, you know, growing up around here, most of my neighbors either worked at Lockheed or IBM or HP, you know, Apple came along. I, I, I grew up in Cupertino, so Apple came along when I was a, a, a kid. Uh, so, you know, then going uh, obviously through school, I, I had an inclination towards the sciences, you know, math and science, physics in particular, and the, the circuits element of, of physics was interesting to me. So I chose to go into electrical engineering, went to UC Davis and got a, a degree there. And then as I was graduating, a bunch of uh, companies were interviewing and, and I got a opportunity to start as an applications engineer at, at Cypress Semiconductor. This was, uh, this was the early 90s. So that, that kind of morphed into you know, my career, kind of various turning points, but uh, started as an apps engineer, which was a great, great place to start, I feel kind of the mix of technology and customer facing and, and, and product that I really enjoyed. Yeah. That's a killer place to start a, start a career. You learn so much by having one foot in the business and one foot at the customer really taught me a lot to have a similar role. Exactly. And I think, uh, I, as I was an apps engineer, I was obviously doing some element of customer support, but then I, I moved to be a, a field apps engineer, which put, put me on point with the customers. And I was, a at that time, I was dedicated to Cisco Systems as the the FAE for Cisco. And so I, this was uh, at the boom times, late late nineties when I took that role on. So I got to to really see a very exciting time in the in the networking industry. And and uh, so th- things just kind of led from there. And what an account to be responsible for in that era too. <laughs> I lucked out. <laughs> I I made good friends with the with the guy that was retiring. I said. <laughs> hey, you want to give it a shot? And uh, I, I thank him for that. And since then, you've been part of a couple startups that have sold for over a billion dollars. So some pretty big startup activities there. But now you're at Light Matter. Can you tell me a little bit about who Light Matter is and, and, and what they do? Yeah, sure. So Light Matter, uh, we're a private company, VC funded. So uh, we're about 150 employees. But technology wise, uh, we're a collection of of people with expertise in a few different areas. One is silicon photonics and building very efficient silicon photonic circuits. Second is very advanced packaging and how to, to, to utilize packaging to, to construct chips. Compute and the software that goes along with compute. But we're really trying to address the scaling issue in, in data centers. I guess that's kind of like the company problem statement in terms of why why do what we're doing at all beyond you know the, the the people and their technical expertise? It's really how to keep scaling going in the data center, both from a an interconnect and a, a compute standpoint, and then how to use our our expertise to do that. Our VCs are are high quality ones. I always look for that when I'm joining a startup because it's <laughs> a they they do a pretty good job of vetting what the ideas are and the people. And uh, in the case of, of Light Matter, we got great VCs. So Google, Square. I said, Google, I said Google, but really TV, Sequoia, Viking, Matrix, Spark, and some others. So that that was key. Uh, the founders, Light Matter, came from MIT, where they were working on various problems at MIT. There's kind of a fun story where I think as part of their graduation 
uh, requirement. They had to take a, a course outside of their area for PhDs. And so they took a course where they formulated some business plan around, uh, uh, around a company that they won the competition. And, you know, uh, one thing led to another. And, and so Light Matter was hatched, uh, you know, a few years back. I love that. Yeah. Do you have a background in silicon photonics or was this kind of new for you? I actually have a pretty limited background in silicon photonics. So I'll just uh, tell you that right now. It's it's one of the things that excited me about joining Light Matter was the opportunity to learn learn more about it. My, my background is in semiconductors, you know, I, with pram, programmable logic, uh, multi-core processors with integrated networking, the data center Ethernet switches. My last company, Inovium, built uh, very large scale data center Ethernet chips. So I guess, you know, I'm, I'm coming from the perspective of, of working on very large chips, seeing some of the constraints that all companies are hitting in terms of practical limits on the size and power consumption, but yet how to kind of keep the, the scaling going and utilizing different fashions to do that. And so Light Matter has some pretty unique approaches to, to, to doing that that ultimately attracted me to the, to the company. Before we go into passage and some of the other really interesting things that are happening, mm -hmm. can you, on a broad scale, tell me about silicon photonics as a whole? Like, what are they and how are they different from traditional photonics? Yeah. So, I think a lot of the photonics circuits and subsystems that have been integrated into, into networking type of equipment historically have been based on, you know, various discrete components, you know, that were physically packaged differently, made of a lot of different materials, some of them exotic materials, glass, you know, some of them are just made out of glass. And so you would have to, to construct the very integrated system was it's been pretty tough, frankly, because you're dealing with a lot of different suppliers, a lot of different technologies and trying to piece parts together to create something integrated. So, you know, silicon photonics is really just applying basic semiconductor manufacturing techniques to implementing photonic circuit elements and then doing that at a, at a very high level of integration. So using photolithography, using silicon as the medium for the, the optical transmission of, of the signals uh, on, on chip, that's really what, what silicon photonics is about. It, it uses a, a manufacturing process very similar to, to, to many other CMOS chips. In fact, the chips that we build have transistors and photonic uh, circuit elements on them. And, you know, what are those circuit elements? They're things like modulators, things that take electrical high-speed signals and convert them to uh, an optical signal. Waveguides, you can think of a waveguide just as a, a optical fiber, but it's, a, it's in silicon and we can, we can implement very large numbers of, of waveguides on a, on a silicon chip photo detectors kind of going after we've done electrical to optical and, and transmitted the signal to go back to an ASIC that's electrical. We do a, an optical to electrical. So there's, you know, photo detectors and, and TIAs and things like that that are, that are integrated in silicon photonics. You, you mentioned that there's optical transmission right on the chip. That's right. Normally, I think of light coming into an optical electrical converter, and that goes down into your, your ASIC and your packaging's all kind of electrical focused. But in this case, you're doing like almost mixed domain is probably not the right term, but mixed electrical and optical on a, on a single chip. Yeah. So the, the manufacturing process that we use allows for transistors and these optical components on the same chip. So the, you know, the transistors are used for a lot of the, the control circuits, the, the elements that are needed to, to set the photonics in the right state or stabilize them, things like that. Like in the case of our interconnect product, we're, we're taking a high-speed electrical signal, and then right after it enters the chip, we put it through a photonic modulator. And the modulator, it uses laser light as an input source. And so then it, we, we basically are able to, to modulate that signal, and then we have a, a light signal that is traveling on a, on a waveguide. And that waveguide can go you know, to various points within a single reticle or in the case of the things that we're building can actually even go across reticle sites so that the, the signals are, are truly traveling in, in, in these waveguides. The waveguides can also be uh, terminated into 
external optical fibers. So to scale out these systems further oh. beyond what we're integrating on on chip, we bring external fibers in, and then the the signal path just continues through the attach point of the waveguide to the fiber. So it's almost backwards. So instead of having like an optical transmission line, you're bringing electrical in, converting it to optical, and sending that around the chip. And that really has to do with the fact that the compute devices and the networking devices and things today, they're electrical chips there. And, and it's more, you know, how do, how do we, you know, one of the problem statements is how do we scale that, that communication up, up to very large scale efficiently? Plug-in optics have been used traditionally to do that in a lot of networking and server equipment, you know, where you have an electrical signal that goes out to a cage, but that signal might be going, you know, several inches before it before it gets to the cage where you do the electrical to optical conversion. In the case of the things that we're building, we're just doing it like right underneath the signal bump of the of the ASIC. Interesting. So we're using 3D integration to to take, you know, digital ASICs, you know, accelerators, CPUs, GPUs, what what have you, and uh, and doing that conversion very close to the to the signal source. It gets a lot of power efficiency. It gets, you know, there's a lot of efficiencies that come with that. A lot of, of density also, just the ability to escape a lot of, of bandwidth in a, in a very dense fashion. Does that help with heat too, I imagine? It does help with heat uh, in, in a few different ways. You know, One is just the, the energy that's consumed in the entire transmission of a, a bit of information is you know, a few picojoules per bit. Whereas if you're driving along electrical trace, a lot of capacitance and, 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 and resistance, you're burning a lot of power there. Also, the, the driver, that's the signal driver that's in the ASIC that we're connecting up to doesn't have to be nearly as powerful. It doesn't have to drive the signal nearly as far. So it can be, it can be sized appropriately for the, for the application. So there's savings both kind of on the, on, on our side, on, on just the efficiency and the, the transmission that we're doing, but there's also savings in the customer ASIC uh, because they can utilize, you know, lower power uh, drivers and, and receivers and things like that. So where are these chips going? Are they going into, you know, rack mount server hardware or what does this, what does this look like? So the, you know, they're going into data centers. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, the exact place that they go, there's a few different places they can go. In in certain cases, let's say uh, if you were if you had an accelerator or a processor of 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 some kind, you could utilize this type of technology to uh, connect up your ASIC right on the on the on the compute motherboard and do a, a an optical conversion uh, right there. Uh, we can also use this technology to build dedicated circuit switching elements at the you know that might be used at a at a rack level or at a at a cluster level to implement the second level uh, of interconnect. Is this your passage technology, or is that something different? Yeah, I think I'm 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 referring to passage largely in the things I've been talking about up to this point. I should mention that we we're also using the silicon photonics to do uh, matrix compute. So it's a different application of silicon photonics, and we we'll, we can we can get into that a little a little more further. But yeah, passage is our our product that is really a a programmable optical fabric. You can think of it like an an active interposer uh, that uses waveguides. But it's and when I say it's programmable, what that means is you can change the the state of the topology of of, of how all these waveguides are connected in in silicon. Uh, so you can use that to connect things up in a fashion that optimizes performance for a particular workload, as an example. Uh, you could use the programmability to implement resiliency schemes in the network, you know, and wrap around uh, failures of, uh, you know, various points of the network. So the, there, there's a lot of different applications there, but you can think of it as a, a chip on wafer technology at a packaging level or where we're mounting customer ASICs 3D integrated on this active optical fabric and, and and so that's kind of the the concept is we can connect s- die level uh, products, and, and and they can be you know various types of components depending upon the application scenario that we're going in, and and scale things up optically. Interesting, yeah. An optical interposer makes a lot of sense to me. 
Yeah, and, and, and it, it helps different people like to think of it a different way. As I, I've said, I've, I've heard that from, from several folks. We struggled with what to call it initially because it's, it's <laughs> sort of a, a, a product category of its own. It's novel. But I think active optical interposer, uh, and then you add the programmability aspect, that's, that's certainly one way of thinking of it. It's like an FPGA meets an interposer <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> How do you actually implement that programmability? I, I, I can't imagine there's like prisms rotating on a chip. How, how does that work? Uh, so there are silicon photonic uh, circuit elements. There's a few different types of, of common ones. There's uh, ones called MZIs, uh, Mach Zender in- interferometers. Uh, there's ring, uh, ring resonators. Essentially what they are is, is just uh, circuit switching elements. And so you use fairly simple control interface at the, at the chip level to change the state of those circuit switching elements. And, and that's how you achieve the programming. It's a, it's a fairly simple interface at a hardware level. And you could have a fairly simple uh, software framework that, that achieves that configuration. When I was reading up on this, I saw you can even send out signals like through different bumps, right? So you can program it to say, you know, to make those connects to your your customer's ASIC. How are you physically connecting from a chip to a to a passage? Do you call it a passage? What do you call the actual? No, so, yeah, passages are silicon. So you know, so ultimately, that's that's the silicon that we're designing. Our customers are are designing the the, the top side silicon, and and so we can work either with chips they've already designed. In which case, when we design passage, we uh, make it such that the bump map, you know, on the top of our chip matches what's on the bottom of their chip. Uh, in certain cases, where we're doing co-design with customers, that's that's where we extract sort of the full value out of it because now, at a floor planning level, we can the customer. As an example, for for most chips with a lot of high speed interfaces, they would have to normally put all of the high speed signals on the periphery of the chip, right? And they'd be they'd be kind of real estate limited on that edge. But now, because we're modulating the the signals directly underneath the signal bump on the ASIC, you can actually move those signals into the interior of the chip. It's one of the ways you you get a lot more bandwidth density with a with a passage solution. But yeah, essentially, we're just we're just putting a, an electrical connection point right underneath the the bump on the bottom of the customer die, and, and so that and, and then by putting our modulators right underneath that that connection point, the the electrical channel is, is very short. And then because we have a, after we've modulated it, it's on a waveguide, and we have a whole network of of such waveguides. We can control the connections between all those waveguides. That's how we can get programmability in that in that connectivity on a and 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 adjust that. Uh, one thing I should mention also that's that's quite unique in what we're doing is a waveguide can actually go across reticle sites. So you know normally you're constrained with what I can fit kind of on on one reticle. We actually have waveguide stitching, so. We can stitch a waveguide such that it can go all the way across several reticle sites, you know, potentially even across an entire wafer if you were to do something completely wafer scale. And it's it's really just an optical circuit, ele- you know, switch element, an optical wire, if you will, that, that goes across that whole, that whole signal path. Uh, can you explain what a reticle site is for people who aren't familiar? Yeah, reticle site. Uh, you know, when you're when you're printing uh, semiconductors, you're you're defining a a die area, and so there's you know based upon your manufacturing technology, there's a kind of a, a a maximum size constraint of what you can build there, and then what you're doing is you're you're stepping the lithography across a wafer to you know to to print n copies of of essentially this, the same thing across that wafer. That's how that's how you build chips. And then once the ASIC's connected, it just it looks like CERTES. Is that is that correct? The ASIC just sees the electrical signals that it's receiving and sending. So the the to the ASIC, they're just transmitting an electrical signal and they're receiving it. The, a lot of the what what we're doing down in passage is fairly you know transparent to them. Fascinating. 
And that's that's how we're able to to work with ASICs, for example, that have already been built. And and so there's you know there's there's definitely use examples where where that's what we're doing. And then in other cases, uh, you know, we've already been engaged for a while, and 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 so we can do things kind of really leveraging the full power of the technology by doing co-design. It, it feels like co-design is a super powerful thing in this situation. What are questions that or, or problems that chip designers might be struggling with that should make them think, oh, Passage might be a good answer to this problem I'm trying to solve? Yeah, I think it, a lot of it comes down in, in, in a lot of the applications that we're seeing of like, how do you escape all of the bandwidth off of the chip that you need to to continue the performance scaling. And so if you sort of accept that I can only make I can only make this single chip so big for yield reasons or power reasons or or whatever, you you, you have to keep that performance scaling going. If you look at inside of a, a given chip today, you have a lot of density in the in the electrical interconnect. But once you start breaking things up and and having pluggable optics or or you know, very long, you know, physical printed circuit board electrical connections. You start hitting a lot of constraints, and so that's one of the reasons that, for example, in a lot of the AI data center scaling, the interconnect hasn't nearly kept up with the growth in the in the compute. And so the the problem that we're solving for them is how do I get access to all of the bandwidth, and how do I escape it off of this this particular die site so that I can so that I can achieve the the interconnect bandwidth density to keep performance scaling going at the at the workload level. I think at also at the system level, because with passage, I, I can connect m- many chips up on on a single package. I don't have any external connection points there, so I could connect, let's say, four or eight ASICs just on on something that's self contained that goes into one physical package, and all the connectivity is self-contained within one physical package. Correct me if I'm wrong, but what I hear you're saying is the the ability for compute power is, is just getting faster and faster. We know this through Moore's Law, right? Yep. But one of the restraints is that you still have to traditionally connect only to the perimeter of your chip, and that's where all your, your bandwidth your throughput comes from. Yep. But with Passage, you can essentially connect from kind of anywhere on your chip, and you can throw multiple chips together on a single Passage, and then you just have one unit just kind of clipping into wherever it needs to go. That's right. And, you know, like waveguides as an example, optical waveguides are one fortieth the size of a, of a fiber. So if you're, if, if you're thinking about how dense that communication can be, that gives you one, one view into that. I mean, you know, imagine I've got 40 X the density that I can, uh, that I can achieve in silicon versus, you know, immediately going outside and going into a, you know, a, 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 a pluggable or some other externally connected uh, uh, chiplet to do the connectivity there. That's that's a really interesting and innovative solution. I haven't ever even considered something like that before. How how do people react when they first hear about it? It's it's interesting. I, they 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 figure out what to call it <laughs> first. So, <laughs> kind of getting back into the the uh, discussion that we had a little earlier. And, and again, people's brains are are approaching this with with different experiences, and so you know, the the name that resonates with with one person, and I I, I think they they're fascinated, frankly, as, as I would say, this is their typical reaction. Yeah, uh, it's wow, yeah, I never thought of building something quite like this. You you kind of see the more natural evolution of well, this is how things have always been built, so it, it does seem. A, a quite different concept. Although I would say, uh, you know, at, at the large companies that have been focusing on this problem for a while, I think lights start firing off, you know, pretty quickly. And, and this, you know, th- this aligns with, with thinking that some of them may have been contemplating for a while, but just nobody had enabled it. And no, no, no individual team really had the, the pieces that we need to construct something at, at, at this scale and, and, and this performance level. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily make sense for one company to develop that as part of their other you know, chip making activities. Whereas for, for you, for Light Matter, you can focus in on this as a, as a core technology and spread that out. I think we can help 
help solve the problem these that these companies are 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 facing in terms of how do they continue you know can continue scale, scaling and and really support their their internal efforts there with complementary technology and and you kind of really approach it as a partnership were there any parts of this technology that were surprisingly difficult or surprisingly easy to implement it, everything's easy for me because I'm a marketing <laughs> product guy no I Honestly, this stuff is challenging. It's uh, yeah. the, the number of, of PhDs involved in, in silicon photonics uh, percentage wise is is definitely a, a different mix than than what I've seen before. There there are very complex phenomenon that you know that happen. You know the the the, the math and the physics involved at, at at the circuit level are are there. I think not all of the problems are necessarily just technical and technology and what's possible to build i think a certain amount of it is is just the maturing of of this segment of the industry you know i i think there have been uh various efforts you know a- across the space for a while and 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 i would say that the the rate of of uh, of kind of completion of the full ecosystem has only recently gotten to where it needs to be to, to facilitate building these things and, and deploying them at data center scale. So I, one, one challenge I'd, I'd say that, that we see is, you know, uh, and, and that we're working on and, and in conjunction with partners is silicon photonic chips are, you need laser light sources. So making sure that we have a, a broad availability of these, the right power levels, the right level of integration, I think is a, is 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 a key enabler for this uh, segment of the of the industry. I'd say you know there are, there are plenty of challenges, uh, but, but I, I I don't see any of them as really fundamental. It's it's mainly you know ironing out all of the processes and procedures to to build these at at true data center scale. Yeah, implementation is often the hardest part. <laughs> yeah, and it's like like I said, I you know the the expertise and the science and the challenges that have to get solved in the circuit level, I, 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 I can't fully recap. You know, I, I know they are very complex, and then we're we're very very uh, happy at Light Matter, very fortunate to to have been able to access some of the really top top talent across the industry in analog and photonics. I, I should talk about packaging as well. You know, when it when it comes to construct these these uh, assemblies, uh, being able to do multi-die assembly there is a ton of of technology in the in the packaging as well and we're uh we're quite fortunate to have some of the the top uh uh, packaging talent in the industry also on our team i've said it before and i will go on record anytime anyone wants but packaging engineers are some of the unsung heroes of the asic world for sure i i think that's absolutely true and i i feel they're not going to be unsung for much longer (laughs) because the the industry is is realized how critical that these advanced packaging technologies are to 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 keep things moving forward. Yeah, they'll be getting their due, and that, and hopefully already are. Yeah. So you can use light to transmit data, but I understand you're also using light to do some math, and it's a matrix math, which is especially relevant given the the boom and trying to roll out AI into data centers. Can you talk a little bit about Envice and what you're doing with with that? Yeah, with the the idea with Envice. From the photonics uh, standpoint, is that we're utilizing uh, photonic-based circuits to do the matrix vector product that is at the core of a lot of the AI compute. So it it turns out that the certain photonic circuit elements naturally accomplish things like multiplications and the act modulation naturally accomplishing uh, a multiplication. And so what, what we're doing with Envise is we've built uh, some of the very most integrated photonic circuits that, uh, that utilize uh, these photo cores, we call them, uh, which are really uh, silicon photonics-based matrix vector chips. And they're connected in a single package along with other digital chips that do pre- and post-processing in the, in the system interface to, to implement an, an AI accelerator. So instead of building like a traditional silicon gate based multiplication system or block, you're doing it with optical 
optical signals? That's right. Yes, yeah, so we're actually doing a, a digital to analog conversion, and then the the mass, if you will, is done in the in the optical domain, and then we do we go back to the electrical domain to transfer the data back back out of the system. But the actual matrix vector product we're we're implementing in you you can call it photo photo analog realm. Yeah, you know it's uh, it's using photonic components to to do that that function. That's wild. I'd never considered that as an option before. Yeah, I hadn't either <laughs> until I came to, <laughs> to, to to light matter. But it it makes sense in that you know to keep the scaling going, and we all know how power hungry you know some of the these chips that people are building today are you know pushing a thousand watts on a on a per chip basis, and the amount of energy that's being utilized to do that function. And then when you look at that, a large percent of the, the total function of a lot of these chips is dedicated to, to that matrix math. It makes sense to find ways of optimizing that, that piece using, you know, new techniques that aren't, aren't limited by some of the physics that the digital CMOS circuits are just in terms of, of, you know, individual transistor performance power ratios or, you know, the interconnect uh, scaling and, and, and metal resistance and, and capacitance. So there are there are scaling vectors for doing uh, math this way that that can extend far beyond where the the technology is even even today. So I think in terms of looking at at the future potential, it's quite quite significant here. Yeah, a lot of room to grow is what you're saying. Yes, yeah, I think this is a uh, this whole segment is just at the. At, at at the very start, huh. where people have have been proving that it can be done, you know, at 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 scale, and I think you know, light matter's really been at the forefront of that uh, with with our Envise initiative. It's so exciting to me to see these new technologies starting to bloom and what that might mean, you know, in five, ten, or twenty, fifty years, whatever it looks like. I completely agree. I also read somewhere you can even. Much like an RF, we'll divide up this, the frequency spectrum and do things in the same, you know, in the time domain, we'll do things in parallel by doing it at different frequencies. I think I read you can do that with light too. So you can essentially do processes in parallel by using different wavelengths. Yeah. So Daniel, uh, with, with Passage, one of the other key things uh, that I should mention, we've talked about some of the fundamentals of operation. So what, and, and, and all of those are, are exactly how, it, how the, the device is designed and worked. What is super important to, to understand is that we're actually doing using WDM techniques, in other words, using multiple wavelengths so that we're transmitting multipliers on the bandwidth. For example, if I'm using eight lambdas on a waveguide, I'm transmitting eight times as much data at the data rate. And that's a, a huge multiplier on the, the bandwidth density. And, and so that really goes across silicon photonics, but with with our technology like Passage, we're using multiple wavelengths. Again, let's say I had a, a 56 or 112 gigabit per second uh, signal electrically. I could put a, a N of those on a, a, a wave waveguide that, that uses N uh, wavelengths of light. And, and so we can get, let's say, 8 or 16 times uh, multiplication in terms of the bandwidth density. These techniques have been used, op, you know, in... And, and various optical components, but we're integrating that WDM on on silicon. Fascinating. Yeah, I like to think of using multiple wavelengths as kind of doing like PAM4. It's like instead of two levels, you now have four levels and you basically get a multiplier and double your throughput just by by tweaking that. Yeah. That, that similar similar concept. Yeah. How do I how do I double or quadruple or octuple the, the amount of, of of communication I get in a unit? That's that. That's a good analogy. Is this mostly AI driven, or what's the motivation behind all this? Uh, I would say AI is a is a primary is a primary driver, but it's really any kind of compute scaling. So if you generalize it and and and, and say to build a larger supercomputer, uh, you know to 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 accomplish a you know a much more complex task it's ultimately about how do you connect up lots of disparate processing elements and memory and things like that in the most efficient fabric to where you know that fabric is not the bottleneck to performance 
in improving bandwidth efficient, you know, the the utilization efficiency of the compute that you do have. So I, I think maybe that's an important point, which is which is in in a variety of these systems today, because the interconnect hasn't kept up with the compute capacity. And I use the term compute loosely here. It could yeah. it could be an acceleration function. It could be you know regular compute like in a in a CPU. But we have a lot of of underutilized, very powerful compute engines. So it's it's really about how to unlock the potential of of what's there and utilizing it in the most efficient fashion to to drive ultimate workload performance. And uh, and it, it it's about eliminating that interconnect as the as the bottleneck, so that I'm not buying a another very expensive you know compute unit. I have plenty of compute. I just can't get the data into and out of it to utilize it effectively. And that's what I'm hearing, I think all the way through the stack is utilization of like GPU clusters is a is a very real challenge. Yes. And as we're rolling this out, we see all these little bottlenecks that we didn't think about before, but are now very apparent because there are data centers with hundreds of millions of dollars of GPUs sitting idle waiting for like the network topology or the interconnects to you know to catch up. Right. And if if you go to any number of conferences, you'll see it, you know, a presentation that'll show you a curve of of kind of compute growth and then interconnect growth. And it's yeah. they, they I laugh sometimes because I went to one conference and I, I saw nine variations on on that. So it's very real. And uh the, the these companies realizing have realized it. And so it's really about how to address that, uh, you know, in, in terms of how they're constructing these chips and, and how they're connecting up many of them in a in a cluster. That's that's really the problem that 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 we're trying to address. It's funny because a couple of years ago, if we were having this conversation, we would typically be talking about heat and and bandwidth. And now we're talking about how do we how do we run these things faster, which means almost more heat. It's like the the problem scope has shifted. Yeah, although it's it's sort of circular, I would say, because one of the reasons, yeah. You're generating heat that isn't necessarily useful heat. Right? Sure. So like yeah. if you have underutilized elements, it's it's like it's gonna cost you the heat, but I've got to I've gotta make sure that that I can unlock the potential that that's there as opposed to just throwing more inefficient compute at at, at the problem. Yeah, the heat has to be worth it. You know, the demand is going to be there. People want you know, what is the most amount of performance I can I can cram into, you know, into this data center or this cluster of a data center that people will always try to maximize that. And then there's practical constraints of, of, you know, power delivery and cooling and, and, and things like that. But if, if you just assume that, that you're, that you're going to maximize that anyway, yeah, then, then it, it is still a very worthy goal of, of making all of the compute the most efficient it can be either by just making that compute fundamentally lower power, such as like the things that we're doing with Envise, uh, or eliminating the, the connectivity bottleneck to unlock the, the compute utilization or by making that interconnect power consumption, you know, the, the actual power consumption of the interconnect lower uh, by doing it more efficiently and so we're doing that in Passage. I think Passage addresses, you know, two last vectors that I talked about, and and Envise addresses the compute power efficiency. Yeah, it's an interesting solution to be able to address both of those problems at the same time. Yes. Can you talk about your Idiom software stack? Yeah, Idiom is a, is a very complete development software framework for for Envise. So it it utilizes common workflows, PyTorch, and, and TensorFlow. So it, it, it's a full a development suite, includes compilers and optimization tools to, uh, to really compile and implement with a variety of different machine learning frameworks and, and be able to run and, and utilize those on, on Envise. So I think uh, Light Matter was wise as a company, and I would say that the previous uh, startup companies I worked with were similarly wise in terms of investing in in the software effort early, 
and have uh, have recognized that as a, a fundamental advantage of the solution that we can bring in terms of very easy to use uh, software that that works in very standard and familiar uh, development flows that uh, the developers are used to using to access the the acceleration that we're implementing in hardware so they don't have to worry about the fact that we're you know uh, doing it a certain way it's really a yeah. very familiar uh, development flow it's we're, we're abstracting away a lot of what we're doing at the at the implementation level in our hardware through the idiom software stack idiom's an interesting name because it, it speaks so well to the abstraction that you must be doing to make it feel familiar to developers but to do such a radically different like filer <laughs> approach yeah yeah we have a great branding uh firm <laughs> we work with <laughs> the light matter that's uh <laughs> that uh it's it's one of the fun things about working at, at at light matter i think there's a there's a lot of creativity and uh you i think you can see a lot of it come through in our branding if you just look at our website and and and, and the various things that we do uh, so, so you mentioned uh, your your previous startups, Inovium and Ca- Cavium. Cavium, yeah. What are some of the traits from those startups that Light Matter also shares beyond software that that makes them so successful? Yeah, I, I think there's a few things. If if I look back, you know, both of those companies and and this one as well are aligned with some major trend that's going on, kind of at the industry at at large. And they're d- slightly different ones depending on the company. Like in the case of Cavium, it was the advent of, of application-aware networking and having hardware more cognizant of things going on at higher layers of the of the OSI stack. Incorporating encryption technology was was a, f- a fundamental piece of that. So that was kind of like the underlying trend, and then and then recognizing a, a pretty serious gap in the approaches that were u- being utilized to to address performance uh, needed there. Now, translating that to Anovium, it was you know, cloud data center, massive growth, and how to implement networking in a super lean and mean uh, manner for maximum performance scaling in the data center, but having visibility, uh, again, back to the application and the user level, uh, to to make sure that those data centers operated in very very smoothly and efficiently. So kind of big growth and market deficiency in the de facto uh, approaches to doing these things. So for the case of Cavium, it was okay just throwing Xeon CPU cycles or or using very specialized microcoded processors that nobody could figure out how to program. So then they had a <laughs> unique solution approach. Both companies did. The third element I would say for every one of these companies, you got to lock in your first early customers and and work extremely closely with them to to make that a success. And then your success multiplies. It's uh, Silicon Valley and the rest of the technology community. A lot of it operates by word of mouth and and wording word spreading of 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 you know successful engagements and. Uh, I would say both companies there did an excellent job of of engaging the early customers, working extremely closely with them, not just at a sales field apps level, like across the company, engineering to engineering relationships, executive focus on 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 execution, leading to leading to a successful outcome. And and I think also focusing on win win outcomes for 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 the the companies and 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 the startup, you know, uh, finding a good alignment there where where it was it was truly win win win, and then there's kind of something I carry as a just general business philosophy, but I and I, I think Light Matters doing that. I think uh, you know big big problems. You know how do you, how do you keep scaling going, yeah. uh, compute and 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 interconnect to you know for AI, but other other things as well. How do you enable chiplets? You know major major trends in the industry, very unique, powerful technological approach. And now, you know, we're in the, uh, we're in that third phase of, of working with our early customers to, to bring it to full fruition. And, and with that, I think we get to, you know, that's, that's what propels us to, to the next stage of the company. When you're around the physical or virtual water cooler, talking with other folks inside of Light Matter, 
what about where light matter is going the future technology is getting people excited i i think it's it's how impactful the technology can be very quickly i think people there's a some of the value props that we were able to bring to our early uh, customers are are sufficiently clear and in the size of the market i think what's maybe different about light matter for me is, is the size of this end market is is much larger than uh mm. you know whereas previous opportunities let's say was a few billion dollars probably the total market sure for uh, you know chips of in in this space here it's you know, tens of, of billions of dollars per year so i think i think that and and also the opportunity to be kind of the primary pioneer pushing this this silicon photonics in, into these you know very impactful deployment cases you know being able to see the impact that it will have like on real data centers being built motivates people yeah you know and everybody's different in terms of what personally motivates them but I think for some people, it's probably just the opportunity to work with uh, with such you know brilliant people in their field, and and being able to push the envelope uh, probably motivates them. For me, I, I think I I get personally motivated by s- seeing the end result of it all, and and, and being able to look back and uh, and and know that we played a significant role in the the evolution of of. Of a, of a big segment of a of a very large industry, I, I think that's what that's what motivates me, and and you know getting to work on all the challenges that come along with with making that happen is is the fun. It's also the stress. You know, <laughs> it's, the, it's never easy. Yeah, um, it's never easy. Yeah, yeah. Seeing a, a full product life cycle and seeing it come to fruition and gain industry you know deployment and acceptance is it's an incredible experience to watch it from conception to, to deployment and adoption. Absolutely. Yeah. And I guess they say cradle to grave, you know, and, uh, yeah, I, uh, it, it is, it is quite satisfying though. When, when, when you're on the back end of it, 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 uh, you can tell the story is a little differently than when you're in the thick of it. <laughs> That's very true. That's very, for so many tech companies, is that true? When you look at the history of uh, how things started and, you know, garages uh yeah yeah <laughs> so we like to do a lightning round we're about out of time here so some quick questions quick answers one of the things you've you've mentioned early on and and you, you talked about working with some of the people who are the best in their field are there any openings at light matter uh, any particular job openings you might want to highlight yes there there are a bunch and it's across really every function so please uh you know, we're, we're, we're quite active in hiring. I think it goes across engineering. So, you know, analog, photonics, digital, DV, um, supply chain product. I have a position I'm hiring for on, on my team right now. Uh, we've hired, you know, we're hiring in a very steady clip uh, right now. We received over $300 million of funding last year. So we're at uh, you know very strong uh, cash position. We're we're growing, and it, it really is across the whole company. And we have our primary offices are are in Boston and Mountain View, California. That's where I'm located. Uh, so those are our primary offices. Uh, but we're we have, we have uh, you know folks folks in other locations as well. But those are the primary locations that we're currently focusing on. Um, and we've recently added Toronto as well as a the site so we're, uh, we're, we're doing some hiring up there as well but yeah I, I i can't really limit it to one function because i think <laughs> if if you were to look at our open positions it's it's really across the whole the whole company fair enough when you look at where the world of of data centers and, and networking and and compute is going can you cast a, a vision for what you think the world might look like in in 20 years that's a long time <laughs> yeah I would like to think that we've figured out how to build very efficient chips, you know, kind of in a, in a chiplet scale approach and, and have true optical integration across everything. And, and, you know, at the chip level, 
at the, you know, within a package, outside of a package, and, and like fundamentally solve a, a lot of the challenges that we have today with just pure, pure electrical scaling. It's, you know, what will a data center look like at, at that point in time? I, I don't have a clear vision on exactly what that is going to, to look like. I think it will look quite different than it does today, though. Absolutely. I think it will look quite different than it, than it does today. If you could wave a magic wand and eliminate one rule or law of physics in order to make this work better or different, is there any rule or law or constraint that you would just poof, make go away? Because she could make resistance go to zero. <laughs> ah, room temperature superconductors. I'm in. Yeah. Well, we're out of time for today, but thanks for coming on the podcast. I really enjoyed talking with you, Daniel. Thanks for asking great questions and uh, been good to be able to share what what we're up to at, at Light Matter. It's a very exciting company. I'm privileged to be kind of a part of the team and uh, excited about about the future. So we look forward to getting to know you better in other capacities as well. Sounds good. Uh, when the opportunity arises, so thanks again for the the time and an opportunity to 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 be with you and share all this with your audience. Oh, it was our pleasure. That was Steve Klinger, VP of Product at Light Matter. If you liked this episode, send it over to someone who you think might be interested as well. And also make sure you're subscribed to Moore's Lobby in your favorite podcast app. And I also love hearing from you on social. So head on over to the Moore's Lobby social pages. Thanks for joining me today. Somehow I was able to get through that whole thing without making any terrible light puns. I guess I was just laser focused on learning as much as I could. I'm your host, Daniel Bogdanoff. I hope you have an enlightened day and I'll catch you next time.